Just very briefly about our school. It's a medium-sized school in a European context with some 600 students, architectural students. And uh, we used to say we are a medium-sized dog with a big dog attitude. Um, about today, I'm going to make a very short introduction and uh, say a few words also about our collaboration with uh, Oscar Property. We're really happy about this, and um, specifically with Oscar Engelbert and Oscar Properties, this very ambitious uh, company producing high-quality apartments in Stockholm. And actually, this is our second uh, joint event together, and we really hope to develop this in the future. Uh, I also would like to introduce Professor Ulrika Karlsson, sitting here. Uh, she is heading the program in architecture, and she will be moderating the questions after the lecture. So there will be time for some, some questions and maybe some discussions afterwards. Okay, we're very proud to host Bjarke Ingels here today. Bjarke Ingels Group, big. They are located in Copenhagen, of course, but also in New York, I heard. Uh, with projects all over the world, we'll see very soon, including the two projects in Stockholm going on right now, Stockholm's Portan and uh, Öregrundsgatan, which uh, Bjarke is involved in, in both. And also I heard that you just won the competition of Kimball Art Center in Utah, in the United States. So, congratulations. First time I listened to you, Bjarke, uh, was in a European meeting in Sintra six years ago. You made this brilliant uh, lecture, and I was totally impressed by your enthusiastic way of speaking and describing your architecture. It was like a totally new thing for me that uh, someone could be not only a talented architect, but also an extremely talented speaker. Uh, and also uh, sort of uh, giving a, a big show or a big event. Uh, uh, and also being very precise and very uh, clever about discussing architecture. Personally, I like the projects in Örestad a lot, uh, specifically the mountain dwellings and the eight house. I think there is enormously lack of fantastic buildings and structures in our cities. Uh, there's a lack of uh, fantasticness, so to speak. Uh, and to me, the projects in Örestad, they exemplify the architects as a wizard, in a way which is a good position for our young students to develop in the future, I think. So, it's something to learn of. Bjarke Ingels uh, on hedonistic sustainability. I, actually, when I, was, uh, when I was in Sintra, it was kind of a historical moment because uh, uh, me and my former partner, Julien, had just decided to split up from Clot. And uh, that day, I was negotiating the the guy who had hamstered the domain big.dk, and I finally got him to cough it up for like uh, 5,000 euros or something. So it was like the birth, the genesis of big. Um, uh, I'd, I'd like to, um, we're sort of here on, uh, on the invitation of, um, uh, of, of Oscar Properties because we are, uh, we're starting to do a, a project uh, in uh, Yadit. And uh, I'd like to try to show like a few, uh, a few of the projects that we've been developing over the last uh, um, maybe five years uh, and, and maybe talk about some of, the, the, sort of the, the big ideas that we have sort of developed and, uh, and that somehow govern our decisions in our work. Uh, the, the first of all sort of being the, the role of the architect or, or what role can architecture play in society. And, um, this is a project we did for, um, it's a diagram for a project we did called uh, Seven New Denmarks, where we tried to organize all of Denmark as a single ecosystem, because we really believe that architects should be designers of ecosystems, not just like pretty facades or expressive sculptures, but systems of both economy and ecology, where we channel not only the flow of people, 
through our cities and, and buildings, but also the flow of resources. Um, and the importance of this role, you can sort of deduct from the atmosphere in this photo. Um, it was taken at the United Nations Conference on, on Climate Change. If it's possible in any way to dim the lights uh, on the screen, that would be, uh, be brilliant. Oh, excellent. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so it was taken at COP15 in Copenhagen. And, and if you look at the faces of, of Brown, Merkel, especially Sarkozy, uh, <laughs> Obama, it wasn't exactly a party. It was, um, it was a complete failure. All of the goals that had been established for the summit were like um, missed. And the general sort of discussion about sustainability was drowning in this sort of general misconception that sustainability is a question of how much of our existing quality of life we're prepared to sacrifice in order to afford uh, being sustainable. Essentially, this traditional Protestant idea that it has to hurt to do good. Um, so when we were asked to look at the, the Danish pavilion for the Shanghai World Expo, where the, the subject of the expo was uh, sustainable cities, we thought, what about a different kind of sustainability? What if sustainable cities would actually increase life quality and would actually increase human enjoyment? Um, that would make it a sort of a lot more desirable uh, agenda. And uh, we decided to design the Danish pavilion as a sort of con condensed uh, streetscape that condensed all of the elements of uh, Danish cities that make them not only sustainable, but also more enjoyable. This is the Swedish pavilion uh, right next to it. And, and the Danish pavilion was um, conceived as this sort of uh, Danish streetscape complete with the blue bicycle lanes of Denmark and the Danish city bikes that we've had for like uh, 20 years. Uh, so you could actually sort of bicycle through the experience, sort of uh, through the exhibition, experiencing how nice it is to bike through the city. Like 37% of all the Copenhageners commute by bike. So they're never stuck in a traffic jam. Two years ago, there was a traffic jam in Shenzhen that lasted 11 days. So some, uh, some guy was like stuck in his vehicle for 11 days. That's the opposite of uh, human enjoyment. Um, and it was designed so you could actually bicycle through the exhibition itself, making it the ultimate museum for impatient people, because you could actually get through the entire exhibition without missing anything in two minutes. Um, it works. Uh, and also, um, Copenhagen and Shanghai are port cities. But uh, in Copenhagen, our harbor water has become so clean you can swim in it. Our first project was the Copenhagen Harbor Bath that extends public life uh, into the water. And we tried to recreate this experience at the heart of the pavilion so the visitors could experience how clean, if not how cold, Danish harbor water is. Uh, this is uh, actually my partner, uh, Jakob, and, uh, and myself testing the, the facilities. Um, and we, uh, we discovered as a way of sort of trying to sort of lure the Chinese into uh, to uh, learn and experience how a Danish sustainable city can actually increase your, uh, your life quality. We were looking for common denominators between Denmark and China, and we found that in the Chinese public school curriculum, they have three fairy tales by Hans Christian Andersen. So all of the 1.3 billion Chinese actually grew up with the story of the Little Mermaid, the national symbol of Denmark. So we proposed to move the mermaid, not a copy, but the actual mermaid, to China for six months. Um, when the Danish Nationalist Party, which is sort of the Tea Party of Denmark, uh, heard about this, they tried to pass a law specifically against moving the mermaid. Uh, and I had to go to Parliament for the first time uh, uh, to, to argue her case. Uh, and as you can see, we, we got her. Um, we also had to get her through uh, Chinese customs uh, and, uh, and into the pavilion. Um, actually, in, uh, in her absence, we invited the Chinese artist Ai Weiwei um, <laughs> to make uh, an art installation as a sort of cultural exchange. And uh, what he did was he, he installed a Chinese surveillance camera in the pavilion, this one. Uh, and it's, uh, it's the same brand that the Chinese state has installed in front of his house to keep an eye on him. He's like as you know, very pro-liberty uh, uh, of speech. But this one was part of an installation he called the Mermaid Exchange that was basically transmitting live footage to uh, Copenhagen where she normally sits so that tourists going in vain would see that she was okay. Um, but more importantly, uh, as a political uh, statement, it was uh, a sort of a, a loophole in the Great Firewall of China because for six months it was the only uncensored live TV feed from China to the rest of the world. Um, 
So, uh, so essentially, this was the first time we sort of, sort of started working with this idea of, of trying to really focus on how sustainable cities and architecture can actually increase uh, the quality of life. Um, we've been pursuing this in various ways. One of them is, is what we call architectural alchemy, that you can create, if not gold, then at least added value by mixing different ingredients that are traditionally kept separate. Uh, we did the, um, first the VM houses in, uh, in Copenhagen, but the mountain is where we sort of coined the idea. It's essentially a hybrid between uh, 100 apartments and a big park parking building. All of the apartments have uh, sort of been turned into this sort of mountain of homes, houses with gardens, where you have a penthouse view, but a suburban lifestyle where you can run out and, and play in, uh, um, outside. Um, and this, uh, this man-made mountain is made possible simply by placing all of the apartments on top of the parking. So the parking occupies all the deep space to the north. There's a single funicular elevator that gives access to all the apartments. And the, and the parking is naturally ventilated and naturally illuminated. So we clad it with an aluminum, a perforated aluminum facade, essentially the, the pr pr probably the cheapest facade you can put on a building. But by, by so varying the whole size in six different sizes, um, and because the holes look dark on the, on the bright aluminum, from a distance it turns into this gigantic urban artwork for free. So we commissioned this Japanese Himalaya photographer to give her this beautiful photo of Mount Everest that really turns it literally into a, a, a mountain. Um, this idea we took uh, one step further in collaboration with our client, Pierre Hüfner, um, for a project called The Eight House, which is in this new neighborhood at the edge of Copenhagen City, this lake delineates the end of, uh, of the city and you have a big park, very much like, uh, like Jared actually in, um, in Stockholm. Uh, it's gonna be part of this new neighborhood. Um, and we, we decided to sort of work with this idea of like trying to see how the different programs could occupy different positions, like shops and offices are placed on the ground. Uh, to the north, they become a four-story office building. Uh, and we also exploit the difference in depth that commercial spaces have uh, deeper floor depths than in residential spaces to create this path. Um, it's really placed uh, on, the, on the edge of, uh, of the city. You have this clash of life forms. Um, but more importantly, what, uh, what we discovered with the Eight House is that this idea of architectural alchemy doesn't only allow us to optimize the conditions for the individual programs, like lifting up the townhouses with little gardens in front up into the sun and the view, sitting on top of a four-story office building. Um, but it also allows the possibility for spontaneous social encounters or the creation of community that is traditionally restricted to occurring on street level is actually invited to invade uh, the three-dimensional space of the urban block. So the eight house is not just like a beautiful facade design or a, an interesting sort of expressive sculpture. It's really like a, a three-dimensional urban condition that uh, uh, invites public life uh, to invade the three-dimensional space of the block and create all of these different niches and, and terraces and, and little intimate urban spaces throughout the, the three-dimensional space of the, of the city block. And um, uh, basically where the eight house, the figure eight, crosses it, uh, itself uh, in the middle, um, basically the, the two buildings block each other's views so we didn't build any of the, of the floors there. We just made a, a social uh, tower that connects the entire building from the bottom to the top, where we consolidate all of the amenities uh, of, the, of the building that ties the entire building together from the ground to, uh, to the roof terrace, uh, where there, there's like this big uh, shared um, social space for the tenants. And you see, this idea was designed to um, sort of uh, increase the interaction between people living there. So a child living uh, on the penthouse could actually walk down and play with uh, his or her neighbor. Uh, but because Copenhagen is this flat, uh, we have absolutely no hills. Uh, there is no place in Copenhagen where you can, there's like no Musebak or like some place where you can go and enjoy the view of your city. Uh, except now people actually go to the eight house uh, uh, on the weekend and, and go for a walk. Uh, 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 actually sort of seriously increasing the revenue of the cafe that's out there uh, because it's really become sort of a man-made extension of the landscape of, uh, of Copenhagen. And the general idea of the architecture is, is always synergy. That the, the facade of the, uh, of the offices become the handrails for the, for the street. 
the actual handrail itself becomes the street light. So each part of the program sort of is tied together in this uh, sort of a, a collaborative or interactive uh, uh, composition. And sort of, so of course we've been sort of working increasingly with, uh, with various ways of, uh, of working with density and also like this way you, you move around or through a building can have a massive impact. Um, another place that we, uh, since we opened our office in, in New York a year and a half ago, um, we've been working with uh, uh, various projects and this is in, uh, in Vancouver in Canada that has exactly the same climate as, uh, as Copenhagen or, or, or Stockholm. Uh, but a very, very different uh, uh, residential density. Uh, basically, the downtown you see here, it's not like uh, office skyscrapers, it's uh, residential high-rises. Uh, it's this beautiful peninsula. Here's a, a Granville Bridge, which is the main bridge that reaches the, uh, the city. Uh, and right next to it, uh, our client uh, owned a pro property uh, where he could build a tower, and the city was expecting a similar tower. They were both going to be 480 feet and create sort of a gateway into Vancouver. And because of uh, affluent Chinese immigration, when uh, Great Britain was going to give uh, Hong Kong back to China, uh, all the Hong Kong Chinese started panicking, and they started purchasing property in Vancouver. Uh, since then, um, it has become sort of the main gateway. 35,000 Chinese arrive every year uh, with uh, $200,000 minimum. Um, so uh, real estate prices are really high. If you take an 85 square meter apartment and you move it one floor up, it increases in value with $15,000. So 20 floors is $300,000. Um, and finally, right next to the side, there's a park where the city doesn't want us to cast any shadows. So you can see the site that our client owns is pretty tortured. It's like being shredded by this bridge. Uh, so he had been working on it for a year and he wasn't really getting anywhere with something he liked. So we started mapping the different uh, restraints, the setback requirements, the setback from the highway. Another setback, which is a 30 meter setback from any highway because the city wants to make sure that nobody looks straight out on the heavy traffic. And finally there's the park where we're not allowed to cast shadows. So we are left with uh, a tiny triangle, uh, 600 square meters, which even for Vancouver is very small. Um, so uh, we were sort of looking at this and then we were thinking if the 30 meter setback has to do with making sure that you have a minimum distance to the traffic, since our client owns the entire site, as soon as we get clear of the highway we can come back out and essentially maximize the amount of the really nice apartments uh, at the top. Um, as a result, when you drive over Granville Bridge, it becomes as if somebody is drawing a curtain aside and sort of a uh, welcome to, uh, to Vancouver. Um, essentially, this like, like a normal high-rise that is, that is wedged into a triangular uh, footprint. Um, so basically, it's, it's a completely rational uh, structure. You have like uh, this like, composition of balconies that creates this almost like feminine silhouette, even though everything is actually at 90 degrees uh, only. Um, and when you leave the city, this sort of striking landmark in a way, it's not some kind of crazy design, it's simply a question of optimizing the, uh, the, the efficiency and the inhabitation of this, uh, uh, of this site. Um, when you look at it on the skyline uh, of Vancouver, you can see it's really one of the boys, but it has this more feminine uh, silhouette to it. It also reminds us a lot of the, this like one moment in uh, New York's uh, history um, that created a condition where, because of uh, increases in value of real estate, uh, steel structure and elevators, suddenly this difficult triangular site uh, suddenly became developable and the Flatiron Building became this striking landmark in, uh, uh, in Manhattan and has now become the namesake of a whole neighborhood. Um, this is like a very similar condition, except uh, uh, ours, we call it the fat iron because it's, uh, <laughs> it's sort of bulging out uh, at, the, at the top. Um, you can see like in, in a lot of our work there's like a very intimate relationship between uh, the building and, and the surrounding city like even in the eight house where it invites public life into the realm of the, of the city or with, uh, with the fat iron where it's really the way that uh, public traffic flows through the site that actually shapes the, the architecture. In a handful of projects we've been working very specifically 
uh, with the public uh, as, a, as the goal of a project or the client. Um, one of our first projects that we built was the Maritime Youth House on the waterfront of Copenhagen, where uh, a polluted site, we were, um, a, third, like a, a third of the building budget was reserved for digging up a meter of the topsoil, because they used to paint boats here, it's part of the marina. And then when you move anything, you have to put it in a, a state deposit and pay a deposit tax. In this case, we had to drive it a, a kilometer away on a truck, dump it back into the water, and then pay a tax. And it seemed kind of a silly way of spending resources moving the problem around. We found out that the, the pollution didn't vaporize, it didn't emit any gases. So we could simply, when you, when you sort of replace the topsoil, it's like putting a lid on it. So we basically just uh, proposed to cover the entire site with a big wooden deck, leave the soil where it was, and create this sort of undulating dune landscape out of wood that becomes an informal playground for the local, uh, the local kids. So essentially by moving resources from the problem, the pollu pollution, into a potential uh, for public space, we could actually sort of create this new, uh, new public destination in, in Copenhagen where the, the local people actually go and, and hang out at night. Also in Copenhagen, there's a rule, you're not allowed to build closer than 20 meters to the water. Because the city saw all of this as public space, you can actually walk on the roof. We were allowed to scoot it all, all the way to the, to the water's edge. Uh, and, an, and another kind of project where it was really like, it was all about the public and the public interaction, was a project we did for uh, Tallinn, uh, the, the city hall of Tallinn in Estonia. And um, Tallinn has this beautiful medieval city that's UNESCO World Heritage. Uh, and the idea was to, to make a new town hall right next to it. We thought instead of having this traditional dichotomy of the, uh, the people outside uh, and the politicians inside, we would hover the town hall uh, above this sort of continuous public domain, inviting people to enter into what we called the, uh, the public service marketplace, where they can go and interact with the public servants and see the politicians at, the, at work. Um, each department has its own building, uh, creating a public village, but they're like condensed to overlap, so they create a continuous public institution. And finally, in the master plan, they anticipated a spire. This is what the city hall of Thailand looks like today. Um, they, they were somehow imagining a tower like northern European city halls look like. So we thought, like, let's put the city council inside the, the tower. Let's give them like an incredibly generous uh, uh, space uh, for political reflection. Like, uh, the ceiling is made as a, as a giant uh, mirror, which means that when the politicians have to make difficult decisions, all they have to do is sort of look up, and then they get a perfect periscope overview of the city that they're messing with. Um, as a side effect, when the angry citizens uh, <laughs> gather to demonstrate, uh, they can see uh, exactly what's going on at city council, like dirty deals uh, are being made, people are sleeping or playing uh, Angry Birds on their iPads. Um, so um, we call this the Democratic Periscope because it combines political overview with public insight. And to our great luck, the city council likes the idea and we're breaking ground in, uh, uh, in the spring. Because um, like, you know, when you're doing a, a city hall, it's all about, you know, what kind of identity does this sort of post-Soviet democracy want to project in terms of political transparency and public participation. Um, so even though it's, in this case, it's a quite large building, but, you know, even small buildings can have, like, very big uh, impact in terms of their symbolic uh, um, uh, meaning. Uh, we were invited to compete to design the, um, the National Art Museum of Greenland. Uh, as you probably know, Greenland is part of the Royal Danish Kingdom, but they recently acquired independence. Uh, and the first thing that they, they wanted to do was to, uh, to build a national art museum for contemporary Greenlandic art. Um, it's, it was designated to be located on the waterfront of Nuuk. It's like an in, incredibly beautiful rocky landscape. Um, and sitting right next to these uh, social housing from the 70s where the Danish would move the fishermen and put them in these sad Danish apartments. Um, we proposed to make, the, to make the museum as a perfect circle, uh, because all Arctic uh, building typologies are circular, you know, to create a, 
a maximum interior volume with a minimum circumference. Um, but simply this perfect circle is then sort of uh, melting, so it like gently follows the, the specific topography of, uh, of the landscape, essentially opening up the interior courtyard to frame a view of the, uh, of the bay. So here you see like the, the nice Danish heritage uh, that sort of dominates the, the sort of city image of Nuuk. Uh, and essentially like by making it completely enclosed from the, from the exterior and having this open interior that then opens up to the surroundings, we could push it all the way to the water's edge. And sort of following the gentle topography of the, of the site, we, we lift up the, the circle, inviting people to sort of uh, continue inside the, uh, the museum. We have a, a big sloping picture gallery that turns into a circular ring of, of large exhibition spaces, some with uh, daylight, some with artificial lights. Um, but the main sort of political statement of the project is that as soon as you go into the, uh, into the, the ring, uh, you find yourself in this sort of, because of the melted geometry, this framed view of the, uh, of the fjord. Um, you have a, a courtyard in the middle. You have like the Greenlandic nature, the Greenlandic uh, local flora and fauna. You have the Greenlandic sculptures and the Greenlandic artworks inside. And, and all of the Danish architecture has been edited out of your view. So it becomes this sort of oasis of Greenland in the middle of a city uh, sort of ruined by Danish architecture. Uh, paradoxically then again designed by a Danish architect, but you know, we're collaborating with the Greenland office. Um, so you can say like in, in some cases, public participation has been a major concern for a project, but in one case, we try to really make it into the driving force of the design, taking it sort of to extreme. Um, these photos were taken uh, uh, on the street where our office is in Copenhagen some years ago. You might remember the cartoon crisis where a sort of a provincial Danish newspaper commissioned 10 cartoonists on a sort of a slightly misconceived crusade for liberty of speech to show that in Denmark we're so liberal and so well integrated that we can make fun of everything, including the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, like a billion uh, Muslims uh, severely disagreed. This is from Syria. Uh, and this is, uh, this is basically where our office is in Copenhagen. And this is a group of, uh, of local uh, uh, Islamic boys that uh, were very frustrated about uh, the cartoons. So it became clear that Copenhagen is no longer like this like uh, homogenous uh, culture where, you know, Everybody thinks the same. We have like a lot of different people with of different backgrounds calling Copenhagen their home. So we were invited to uh, make a competition for a new urban space right next to where our office is. It's the most ethnically diverse neighborhood in all of Denmark. There's 60 different nationalities living around this, uh, uh, this plot of land. And I'm not gonna explain all of the aspects of the project. Sort of uh, briefly, we, uh, we decided to turn it into uh, what we call the, the red square. Uh, it's currently under construction, so this is actually not a Photoshop collage, it's a, it's a photo uh, from an airplane. Um, the red square where everything is like different shades of, uh, of red, uh, including the trees. Uh, the black market where everything is black. Uh, and the green park where even the sidewalk and the bicycle path is green. But in this like very simple color coding, uh, we thought like instead of plastering this urban space with uh, Danish design, it would be kind of strange if the Danes had designed the nicest bench and the nicest lamp and the nicest trash bin. We thought like if, if we consider all of planet Earth as a gigantic urban laboratory where there's constantly being conducted experiments in how to inhabit uh, uh, um, our world in different ways, in, in different cultures, in different cities, we reached out to the local community and asking people to uh, recommend or nominate elements from their other home country um, to create this sort of almost like a, a, an urban exhibition of, of global best practice. Um, and the idea is that you know, we don't eat Chinese food or Indian food to be nice to the Indians. It's like it has nothing to do with political correctness. It's because sometimes we really like feel like Indian food. And it's the same, like we don't build a Moroccan fountain uh, to be nice to the Moroccans. We do it because like Morocco has a, 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 like a very long uh, and sophisticated tradition for architectural water features. So, so now we, uh, we're building this Moroccan fountain in, uh, in Copenhagen. We have a mussel beach 
that combines elements from, uh, from uh, Venice Beach in uh, LA with uh, uh, elements from, uh, from Thailand, uh, China. This like crazy Estonian swing. Uh, <laughs> we, we are actually having some liability issues with this swing. Um, also, we found this slide in Ukraine. It's actually from Chernobyl, so we had to do a copy because the original is uh, radioactive. Um, the, the sign on the red square is the sign from the red square. And even if you take something as banal as bollards from Ghana, when you put them in a gray Scandinavian context, they become these incredibly exotic uh, objects and became like this safari of finding cool stuff from, uh, from different places, like a, a bicycle rack with a bicycle pump from Canada. It's a brilliant invention. I can't understand why we didn't uh, come up with that. Also because like, the majority of the immigrants have an Islamic background. Uh, but everybody has to be re represented. From Israel, uh, we chose uh, uh, a manhole cover, basically like an inch of steel, so it's impossible to uh, destroy it. Um, and if you look at the benches, it becomes like this sort of social project, like a Mexican bench formed like an S-curve, so you can uh, see the person you're sitting next to into the eyes. Uh, a Belgian bench that does the opposite. Everybody's looking away from each other. Um, <laughs> We have like a nice one from Sweden, uh, I think, yeah, this, this uh, Sweden, I don't know, S for Sweden. Um, we, we found this uh, play octopus in Japan. Uh, a crew of Japanese workers came and, and, uh, and built it. Also from Sweden, Jönköping, we have a snow cannon. Uh, bird cages from Holland. Uh, red trees uh, in the red square. Uh, we even found uh, palm trees in China that actually grow in snow. Um, so uh, now we have naturally growing palm trees in, uh, in Nabu. And, and the last element, like one of the main sort of reminders that you're in a foreign culture when you travel, is actually the advertisement. Uh, so as a series of very sculptural lamps, we recreated these billboards that advertise stuff you can't buy in Denmark. Uh, my, my favorite is uh, uh, this one. It's, for, it's a sign for a dentist in Qatar. Um, <laughs> And of course, the red square accumulates all these elements from uh, uh, Soviet and communist countries, uh, including Moscovit, which was uh, one of the worst cars ever produced. Um, so you can say, in a way, like the, the sort of uh, Copenhagen urban space, like rather than perpetuating this sort of uh, petrified image of Denmark as a homogenous culture, it really truly reveals the, 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 the real cult cultural diversity of contemporary Copenhagen and turns this diversity into the driving force of the, uh, of the design. It's, it's opening, uh, it's already partially in use, but it's opening in, uh, in May. That brings me to sort of the, the last category of projects that, that currently interest us uh, quite a bit, um, which is what we call sort of social infrastructure. And you have like a, a lot of sort of examples where uh, the infrastructure of the past can be reinvented as infrastructure for culture and leisure in the, in the present. Um, we recently uh, did a project in Park City, Utah. And Park City used to be a mining town. And actually, the first ski lift, I didn't know this before we went there, the first ski lift in the world was actually a repurposed mining infrastructure. It was essentially lifts that had been designed to drag silver down from the mountain. And when the silver ran out, they had to do something, and they started dragging skiers up the mountain. So essentially, uh, that's what happened to, uh, to Park City. The plumes of smoke of the past has become like uh, uh, clouds of snow cannons uh, in, in the present. You probably know Park City from uh, uh, the Olympic Games in 2002 in Salt Lake City, uh, uh, and also the Sundance Festival that has uh, made its home in, uh, uh, in Park City. Um, and in the middle of the city, uh, the Kimball Arts Center is another repurposed infrastructure. It's a former uh, garage that has turned into an art museum. Uh, and we were invited to look at making a new uh, sort of uh, expanded uh, uh, art museum for, for the Kimball. Um, this is the, the, the garage where the Kimball is today. And here in the background, you see a building called the Coalition Building. It was the tallest landmark structure of Park City when it was a mining town. Uh, it was where all of the s silver lifts uh, came in and you unloaded the silver onto the trains. Uh, it was like an 80-foot tall structure, like this big wooden uh, cabin that rose above the skyline of the city. 
Tragically, it burned down in the 80s and have now sort of uh, disappeared. Um, and if you look at uh, Park City's development historically, uh, the Kimball Arts Center is right here in the middle. Uh, and recently, the main arrival from, uh, from Deer Valley Drive, the main road that goes through the, uh, the mountains, uh, actually sort of arrives right in this uh, point. So the Kimball Arts Center is not only like culturally the, the sort of the, the pivoting point, but really physically and infrastructurally the, the center of, of Park City. So in short, we, we propose to sort of keep the existing garage as it is, just to refurbish it and sort of preserve the, the cultural heritage of the, of the industrial past, and then consolidate the entire new building uh, on a small footprint, making it into a, almost like a tower the same size as the, uh, as the coalition building. It consists of two main galleries, one gallery for uh, uh, media art uh, without daylight that we place uh, along Main Street. And then the upper gallery that we place at the top, uh, sort of facing uh, Heba Avenue, so it becomes the first thing you see when you arrive to, uh, arrive to town, almost like a, a friendly building that turns its head to, uh, to greet uh, visitors. Um, all the public programs sandwiched between the two galleries. And then we started, started like, how can we integrate uh, a new contemporary architecture into this traditional mining town? Um, how can we sort of, uh, in a way, harness this sort of raw charm of the, uh, of the industrial heritage and turn it into something uh, contemporary? Um, most of the immigrants that went to Utah were actually Scandinavians. And they brought with them uh, uh, this sort of uh, log cabin construction with overlapping massive timber. They used this construction to actually uh, reinforce the, the silver mines and to, uh, to build the, the homes. Um, and uh, this technique has been sort of uh, um, rarefied and sophisticated. In, in this case, it's a silo where these uh, square timbers uh, still like, use the interlocking corner joint to create this like, really nice, uh, uh, elegant tectonic. Um, so we basically propose to like to harness uh, this way of building actually to use the fact that wood uh, isn't necessarily just a veneer that we use inside to make our interiors look friendly, but it could actually be not only the structure but also what insulates and what finishes the uh, the building. Also, the Hogans, the traditional huts of the Navajo Indians in Utah, used uh, uh, massive timber to create more sophisticated uh, 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 forms. Um, and finally, the Southern Pacific Railroad used to have a rail track going across the Salt Lake, and it was founded on these big timber piles that were like rammed deep into the Salt Lake. And there they've been marinating for like decades, in sa saturated with, uh, with salt. Um, they have become what bec what's now called trestle wood. There's a company that basically extracts the old wood that is perfectly preserved in all the salt, and has gotten this like incredibly rich uh, uh, texture. Um, so we basically uh, propose to sort of uh, um, really like uh, extract this uh, this wood that is a remnant of the of the railroad infrastructure and use it uh, use the sort of the, the old log construction to uh, uh, to build this uh, this new art museum. So essentially, the new building you have the the stacked logs, uh, and as the as the sort of upper gallery turns, uh, basically using the thickness uh, of the logs. Uh, we can actually just by rotating each log a little bit, we can actually create like this sort of a, a organic curve in a, in a completely simple and traditional uh, building technique, uh, the upper galleries and the, and the roof garden. It becomes like this sort of incredibly traditional way of, of building uh, used in a very, very contemporary uh, expression. Also like the old uh, sawmills actually were big wooden frames with a steel structure inside. And essentially the galleries and the artworks, they require uh, more precise uh, climatization. So the two stacked galleries are simply a steel structure uh, nested inside a, a, wooden, uh, a wooden frame. And all of the circulation is really sort of integrated in this uh, turning uh, uh, wooden structure. So, um, so we just presented the project and, uh, uh, and as you just learned, we. Uh, uh, we, we won the project a week ago, and uh, so hopefully if you go to, um, to Sundance in, uh, in the summer, like in, in the winter of 2016, uh, you'll see this, uh, this gallery turning its head looking down uh, uh, Main Street. When you enter into the lobby, 
you follow the, the raw timber of the of facade uh, up onto the, the restaurant, which is like sandwiched between the galleries. You can extend out on the roof terrace on the, on the garage uh, and continue up uh, with, the, with the light washing down the, uh, the solid wood, uh, passing the workspaces of the, uh, of the galleries. And then finally, the, the upper gallery, which is this uh, big, beautiful uh, daily space uh, that has like a, an, an impressive view uh, uh, for, for people sort of arriving. They'll be able to see what's happening uh, in the upper exhibition and be able to look into the to lower part. So it becomes like this incredibly inviting uh, uh, little uh, art museum. So essentially, this sort of general idea that in this case, once infrastructure has been decommissioned, we totally know how to reinvent it for, for cultural purposes. Um, another example is that we, um, we got invited to, um, to do a competition for the Danish Maritime Museum. Today, it's located inside Hamlet's Castle uh, in Kronborg. Um, but uh, it just became World Heritage. Like, everything in Europe is becoming UNESCO World Heritage, so it's getting very hard to do anything. Uh, but essentially, uh, the museum had to get kicked out because uh, when Hamlet was there, like he was actually never there, but like when the king was there, there was no maritime museum in the, in the castle. So uh, they proposed to put it in this old uh, dry dock where they used to build ships. Uh, the problem was that um, the museum program was twice the size of the dock itself. So we would basically drown the, uh, the dock in museum program, creating this sort of claustrophobic museum. We thought if we could rather keep it as a big industrial void, it was like a 150 meter long space, 25 meters wide, uh, like wide, sunken 10 meters into the ground. Um, and also when we started reading the technical reports, the dock was in such a bad state that to keep the walls from caving in, we would have to make a new dock inside to take the pressure or put new dock walls outside to, to take the pressure before it hits the, the old dock structure. So we thought, if we're going to make a new dock wall anyway, why not leave enough space between the new and the old dock walls to incorporate the museum, essentially to turn the museum brief inside out, um, creating this like big industrial void. This is the original shape of the, of the dock. Um, also, it became the answer to like an unresolvable dilemma that UNESCO said that the museum had to be completely invisible so we wouldn't block the view of, uh, of, uh, of the castle. Uh, but of course, the museum director and the sponsors, they wanted some kind of architectural masterpiece that would uh, attract people to, uh, to visit the museum. And by turning it into a void, we could combine the need for invisibility with the sort of desire for exposure. A visit, you would like walk down this zigzag bridge that would take you into the museum. Each bridge contains programs for the museum, for exhibitions, for auditoria, for, for restaurants. And the bridges also bring daylight into the, um, into the exhibition. So even though the entire museum is actually 10 meters below the, uh, the, the, the surface and eight meters below the water, uh, it's uh, like this very uh, open and daylit uh, space. When we sort of uh, submitted this project, we thought that it was a little bit tricky because there was one condition in the brief, and that was that you couldn't build outside the dock. And we put the entire museum outside the dock. Uh, but um, the jury liked it and we won the competition. But then something strange happened. Uh, the Danish Architects Association, which is basically my union, they sued the client for having chosen a project that broke the conditions of the brief, uh, which seriously made me reconsider my membership of the Danish uh, Architects Association. Um, but um, happily, the clients had gotten so uh, uh, excited by the idea that they thought, okay, we cancel the competition and we hire big as our architects. So, um, so now we, we, are, we broke ground and we're building this surreal project. Like now the, what used to be a void has become like, almost like a ship sitting in an even bigger void. Uh, it's also paradoxically the tallest structure we've built in Denmark, but from zero and down. It's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty absurd. Um, that takes me to the, sort of to, to the last category of, uh, of uh, social infrastructure, which is um, the biggest project we've done now, uh, which is uh, the Loop City uh, in Copenhagen. We were commissioned by the 10 municipalities of Metropolitan Copenhagen to look at tying uh, these different uh, uh, municipal uh, cities uh, together with a new train line. 
Uh, and we thought, like, instead of just looking at Copenhagen or even just looking at Denmark, right on the other side we have Sweden. Uh, we have a bridge connecting uh, the two sides. Uh, it's the most sort of economically uh, uh, active uh, uh, areas in, uh, uh, in southern Scandinavia. Um, and by just adding a small five kilometer bridge, we can turn it into a continuous public loop where no area is further away than 40 minutes by public transportation. Uh, and it becomes not only an infrastructure for public transport, also for waste management, water management, uh, a smart grid that combines the hydroelectricity of Sweden with the wind power of Denmark. Um, also like joining all of the most prosperous businesses in, uh, uh, in the region um, into this sort of new binational capital city uh, that will also introduce pink in a Scandinavian flag for the first time. Uh, and has exactly the same size as the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and the main idea is like, so basically it's only because of the national divide that we haven't been considering this a single metropolitan region uh, uh, until now. And one of the ideas is really to mix all of the different infrastructures, so the train line, the smart grid, everything is really nested into this very dense uh, new uh, uh, urban loop. The first kind of project we're going to be realizing that sort of embodies this potential is uh, in downtown Copenhagen, we won a competition to design a, a waste to energy power plant. And essentially, it uh, transforms household waste. Three kilos of waste turns into four hours of domestic electricity and five hours of heating. Um, seen as a resource, uh, a ton of trash is also almost the same as uh, two barrels of oil. If you look at, um, at these uh, waste to energy power plants, they're like ugly boxes. Uh, uh, and if they have to be in the middle of the city, you somehow have to be very careful about it. It's going to be the tallest and biggest building in Copenhagen. It's right next to the Copenhagen Marina and right next to this place where the local boys go water skiing. Um, and, and Danes, actually, uh, I'm sure that both Norwegians and Swedes uh, laugh about this, but Danes really love to ski. We just don't have any hills. We have snow, but we have no uh, slopes. Um, so we thought we might not have mountains in Denmark, but we have mountains of trash. Um, so we basically decided to check, uh, I think it's Isabel. I'm not totally sure, can anyone recognize it? No, but no Swedes can recognize their own hills. I think this is Isabel, uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's 150 meters vertical drop. Uh, we have 95 meters, so we make a mini put version, saving the Copenhageners like five hours on a bus. Uh, and essentially, we just wrap the machinery uh, with a continuous uh, sloping roof. Instead of making a visitor center where school teachers would drag children and force them to listen to how trash turns into energy, uh, it's an elevator that takes you to a green, a blue, and a black ski slope uh, uh, and actually allows, you know, you will simply have to look out for, for, for Danish alpine skiers in the world championships from 2016 because uh, we'll be able to practice at home now. Um, miraculously, we did win the competition based on this idea. Um, like, seen as an overall, the, the facade is a green facade where the vegetation actually filters daylight into the uh, workspaces of the, of the power plant. And you can say like the, the slide I opened with, um, this idea of creating cities as ecosystems, it's very close to coming to fruition here. It's like not only do we harvest the resources locally, uh, the rainwater, uh, uh, the, the daylight, the, the natural ventilation, but also together with the city, it forms an, an entire ecosystem. Finally, like, it's going to be the cleanest waste to energy power plant in the world. Smoke coming out of the chimney is completely clean, but it does contain CO2. And working with uh, the German artist Realities United, uh, we developed uh, this idea of the mouth of the chimney is designed so that each time there's 100 kilos of CO2, it puffs a gigantic smoke ring. Um, and of course, on one hand, we like this idea that it's the ultimate artistic expression of hedonistic sustainability. The chimney becomes so clean that it becomes something playful that puffs smoke rings. But more importantly, uh, one of the main drivers of behavioral change is knowledge, that if people don't know, they can't act. Um, and uh, you know, nobody knows what CO2 is. It's uncountable. If you come to Copenhagen in 2016, you just have to count the smoke rings. And when you've counted 10 of them, 
we just emitted exactly one ton of, uh, of CO2. Um, actually, s since then, we, we, uh, we took the, the sort of this, uh, this technology here, or like, like the idea of, of skiing on the roof. We're doing a, we won a competition to design a ski resort in Levi in Lapland in, in Finland. And, and the main idea is that all of the penthouses uh, plus uh, everybody else can take the elevator to the, to the roof. And then the, the, this, the, the roof of the, of the buildings are part of the, of the ski slope. No surface has a slope less than 7%. Uh, so you will never have to walk. It really takes the idea of ski in, ski out to the extreme. You can actually ski from your apartment out into the ski system. Um, and of course, the sloping roofs create these like charming uh, uh, spaces. Uh, this is scheduled to break ground uh, actually almost this year, uh, according to the, and, and, uh, and in three years, you, you should be able to should do some ski, serious uh, uh, roof skiing. Um, this brings me to, uh, to Stockholm. Um, We've, we've been sort of involved in Stockholm uh, like, uh, since, uh, since the very early beginning. We, we spent quite a substantial part of our lives uh, trying to work on Slusen uh, in vain. Uh, but, uh, but in a way, uh, uh, not so long ago, we got invited to look, a uh, year and a half ago, we got invited to look at a project that could be like Slusen 2.0. It's Stockholm's port, and it's the main uh, entry into uh, metropolitan Stockholm from uh, the northwest. Uh, it's a huge area, and they wanted to create some kind of a landmark where the two highways uh, cross each other and you come out of the tunnel, uh, like the first thing you see when you get to Stockholm. But it's such a big space. Uh, here we try to map the, the two uh, highways into, and then we took the, uh, the Arc de Triomphe and the whole neighborhood in Paris. As you can see, it's a gigantic area, uh, more than a landmark. What they really need is an urban master plan. And finally, the two highways are, of course, going to be separating all these uh, like different parks and different neighborhoods from interacting with each other. So if we could master plan a way of creating connectivity between the different uh, uh, spaces, that would really work, uh, uh, work well. So if, uh, if they wanted a landmark and what they needed was the master plan, what, the, what they had a lot of was uh, excavation material after like digging like miles and miles of tunnels. Um, so we basically proposed to to sculpt the excavation to create a man-made valley that would take the noise from the highways and allow the city to actually move closer to the rim uh, of this new uh, uh, landscape. So essentially creating these expansion opportunities for the, the new neighborhoods, uh, allowing the city to grow all the way to the edge of this uh, uh, like landscaped crater. And here you see sort of a life on the edge of the park. Uh, you could imagine like a series of public institutions that would sort of inhabit this circular promenade uh, with all the sort of the, the, the park spaces in between. But this didn't re really make any landmark. And also, more importantly, the whole idea of creating this lively uh, uh, park space uh, for, for social life around the, uh, the highway was going to be completely invisible from the elevated highway. So we were like thinking, how, how could we do something? Also, we didn't want to put some kind of big building in the middle. It wouldn't make any sense, because like, the program was going to be on the perimeter. So uh, we finally found this, uh, this gigantic weather satellite developed by NASA in the 60s, or the material is this very, very resistant chrome film. Um, we imagine it could be like a giant road mirror, so that when people uh, arrive to, uh, to Stockholm, they see this immaterial uh, object hovering in the sky that actually shows all of the park uh, and the life of the city around them, uh, sort of hovering in the sky like a Globen uh, 2.0, uh, this time taking off from the ground. Uh, so essentially making uh, the whole master plan visible to the, to the cars. We have to confess, we did, the, we did the competition right before Christmas uh, uh, a year and a half ago. So we had uh, model materials in the, in the office. Um, and essentially, this, uh, this immaterial landmark is tied uh, to the ground, creating some, uh, uh, some piston uh, power. And also, the, the, the solar exposed hemisphere uh, is uh, embedded with uh, photovoltaics uh, that can 
deliver a lot of energy to the, to the expansion of the neighborhood, but 10% is taken as a small tax to keep a pump uh, and a, a heating uh, element running uh, to ensure uh, enough uh, pressure and enough updrift to keep this uh, giant balloon uh, uh, hovering. Um, it has a single uh, uh, um, uh, stick and like these three cables that keep it in, in place. Um, so if there's a catastrophic failure, it's uh, not going to land on the, on the cars. Um, so basically, we proposed this idea that you know we allowed us to to design this like big, beautiful secret valley uh, around the, the park and have this immaterial uh, monument hovering uh, above the highway to reflect the life around the uh, uh, the Stockholm's Gate. And uh, to our complete surprise, we we won the competition and uh, and are now uh, happily engaged with uh, trying to figure out how to actually do this. But it's a uh, <laughs> It's, a, it's kind of a wonderful, uh, wonderful challenge. Um, moving a little bit closer to, uh, uh, to town, Yadid um, uh, is this, like, uh, like this big green park, uh, not unlike the, the site we're building in Ørestad, uh, in uh, right across from uh, Selsing's uh, uh, nice uh, film museum and right next to the, uh, to the harbor. Uh, that's also gradually sort of converting into uh, uh, spaces for culture and, and, uh, and leisure. And uh, we were asked by, by Oscar to, to look at, uh, at creating a building on this corner. And of course, you have this sort of amazing opportunity that you have 270 degrees of, uh, of park. And we, we thought, like, maybe we would sort of try to sort of, in a way, create an overlap between the city and the park uh, to consider the uh, entire site as uh, one form of landscape, um, simply lifting up part of it to create uh, private gardens for the uh, for the residents, while leaving uh, the courtyard uh, public, uh, allowing people to pass through the uh, the building. Uh, and then, essentially, we propose to sort of uh, lift up uh, the perimeter to match uh, with the surrounding city. And sort of as a way of sort of redistributing the building mass, we propose to push down uh, the the southwest corner, uh, opening up to the park, and in return. Uh, move that building volume to the northeast corner, uh, creating almost like a man-made uh, kul, uh, uh, overlooking the, the roofscapes of, uh, uh, of the surrounding um, cities. So it becomes like this sort of gently pixelated, uh, undulating landscape, and you can really see the, the sort of the extension of the, uh, of the facade lines uh, of the neighboring buildings being carried through. And only deeper into the plan, uh, it, uh, it sort of rises up, um, opening up basically everybody to, to face, the, um, face the view. Looking at the uh, uh, apartments themselves, like this sort of pixelated roof landscape becomes like this cluster of, of little uh, uh, private gardens uh, designed in such a way that uh, like three to five of them like group together to create like these like three-dimensional gardens for the people living there. Uh, designed in such a way that you can actually step straight out of your apartment and then sort of uh, um, visit these different uh, 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 levels. So you get this like very sort of exciting uh, garden of, of plateaus. Uh, and essentially almost like a, it becomes almost like a very low resolution uh, photo of a, uh, of a hillside where you have like uh, these different kinds of landscapes occupying the different pixels, hard pavements or, or plants. And essentially, well, like one of the main concerns when you do housing is that if you're trying to do something that is a little bit more interesting than your typical uh, stack of apartments, uh, uh, sort of uh, laid out in a, in a nice box, you have to be like, very careful about costs. And sort of the, the whole project is really based on this sort of uh, like universal application of a building system that has like, the possibility within it of, a, of an incredible variety. So it's all based on this like, incredibly rational and, and efficient system. Um, it's still being developed uh, right now, but, but the current thinking that we, that we definitely want to use is, uh, uh, is, uh, is, is some form of geothermal and also the fact that the roof gardens severely delay the, uh, uh, the, water, uh, the storm water overload on, uh, on the sewage system. In the evening, you'll see like light seeping out of this sort of uh, 
a uh, little man-made uh, hillside. And if you look at the, at the, at the uh, rest of the apartments, the facade are made um, like this sort of a zigzag uh, uh, module, like essentially to, to take advantage of the corner site. All of the apartments are oriented towards the southwest, looking out towards the park. Uh, also like providing the apartments with views in, uh, in two directions. But to uh, ensure like privacy from one terrace to, to the next, or from one apartment to the next, uh, the, the wooden facades, um, basically facing away from the south or the west, uh, the facades are wooden, they're covering uh, uh, the wall here, and then the, the boards are flipped out to actually allow the possibility to, uh, uh, to see out from, uh, from within the apartment. Um, and, and this logic is actually reversed in the inner corners, where suddenly the most attractive uh, view is, is shifting Suddenly, the, the orientation of the apartment is shifting as well. So you have this sort of a, a inversion of the logic. So that means that when you're approaching uh, from the east or from the, from the north, you see that you sort of vertical um, um, wall of wood. Uh, when you're looking out from inside the apartment, you can see, like, you look through the sort of trellis. Uh, that actually ensures uh, maximum transparency from inside out, but it ensures that you're never going to be looking at, the, uh, at your neighbor. Um, so again, like coming from the, uh, uh, from the east, you see this like sloping landscape of wood, uh, and from the park itself, it's like this sort of completely open uh, uh, facade with all these like pushed in balconies and this sort of an inhabited uh, roofscape. So like these like very, very gentle uh, uh, facade uh, uh, lines that are made out of something completely modular and, uh, uh, and orthogonal. And finally, like, I'm not going to explain the plans, but like within this like modularity, we have like an incredible uh, variety possible. And if you sort of... Uh, move off through the, uh, the floor plans, you can see this sort of a, this like moving uh, terrace scape that, uh, that cre creates this sort of continuity of, uh, of private gardens and finally the roof uh, becoming like a, a public space uh, for all of, the, uh, all of the tenants. So, in, so in, a, in a really banal way, it almost becomes like a, an architectural echoing of the of the landscape of the, uh, of the park itself, like this sort of hybrid of park and, uh, and city, creating sort of a natural transition. Uh, again, you see this sort of a Twin Peaks uh, uh, kind of element. And um, if you sort of quickly run through the, um, through the whole project, uh, once again, uh, also trying to sort of, the whole idea of trying to introduce wood as the main uh, perceived material in a, in a large building is, it's relatively new, and also like you can see, like even though it does go a little bit above and beyond the roofscape in general, uh, you actually have like these industrial structures. You have the silos of the port right next to it that somehow completely dwarf it, and it becomes like this very sort of a gentle little extension of uh, of the park uh, up to the roof of the city. Um, so um, we, um, we we're quite optimistic uh, about this project, and and hopefully in in three or four years uh, this could be of you walking down uh, in a Colin Nutley movie uh, in, uh, in Yadid. Um, as, as, a, as a last thing uh, I'd like to, uh, to share with you, and, and maybe you could test the volume. Uh, oh, you did it, excellent, perfect. Uh, maybe it's gonna be very loud, that could be exciting. Um, no, normally, um, like having moved to America, I've, I've often like sort of showing some of the work we've done in Copenhagen and now what we're doing in, in, in Sweden, people sort of, quite often dismiss it as that, uh, yeah, you know, of course, but you can only do this in like socialist Scandinavia where even the developers don't care about uh, uh, profit. Uh, <laughs> sort of, uh, Oscar is a very visionary developer, but I'm sure that he also cares about uh, profit. Um, but uh, a year and a half ago, we got invited by a Manhattan real estate developer uh, and as you probably know, Manhattan real estate developers are notorious uh, uh, for being like very uh, shrewd businessmen. Douglas Durst, our client, uh, he has a house in West Palm Beach where there's actually sharks in the water. 
And he says he goes swimming anyway because being a Manhattan real estate developer, he gets professional courtesy from, uh, from the sharks. Uh, but uh, he asked us to look at this neighborhood in, um, uh, in Hell's Kitchen on the, on the west side of, uh, uh, of Manhattan. It's a, a wonderful site on the Hudson River uh, with beautiful views over the water facing west and south, but also right next to a power plant and a sanitation plant. Uh, so we thought, like, this place really needs some kind of a, a, a sense of place, actually, like a, uh, almost like an, a, an, an oasis in the middle of this very noisy neighborhood. The West Side Highway is taking off right there. So we thought, like, having spent 10 years of our careers trying to escape the tyranny of the typology of the Copenhagen courtyard, uh, the sort of northern European typology of building around a uh, green space in the middle, we thought that it might actually be quite interesting in New York, because you could say in the courtyard is at the architectural scale what Central Park is at an urban scale, like an urban oasis in the middle of the dense city. So the whole project became about what happens when you marry an, a New York skyscraper with a Copenhagen courtyard, or how could you actually create a court scraper. Um, so essentially we place the courtyard next to the Helena. Uh, we try to preserve the Helena's views, because not only is it owned by our client, it's also named after his daughter. Uh, and then to give it Manhattan density in the northeast corner, we lift it up to 460 feet. Uh, um, and very similar to what we're trying to do in Yadit, but in a sort of Manhattan typology, it, uh, it uh, retains the views from, uh, like, like the sunlight exposure from the south and, uh, and the west, and also the views over the Hudson River and the, and the sunset, um, creating this like quite exciting new typology uh, on the skyline of, uh, of the west side of Manhattan, uh, this sort of uh, quite unusual silhouette of a tilted courtyard building um, with a giant uh, uh, courtyard in the middle. Traditionally, the courtyard is some kind of a secret that is uh, kept for the tenants or for Google Earth. Uh, but here you'll actually really be able to see it from the outside. It becomes a spire uh, from, the, uh, from the east. And in this case, it's a continuous, uh, it's a very steep uh, slope. So it's a continuous roof where the, the terraces are sunken into this roof plane. Uh, and because of the asymmetry, all of the apartments actually have views. Even the courtyard itself has views over the, the Hudson. Um, so in a way, you can say this sort of rejuvenation that's happening on the waterfront of Manhattan is, seems to be invading the city fabric of the urban city block itself. Um, we've gone through the whole works. Our client, in this case, had been working on the site for two and a half years, and he wasn't getting rezoning. Um, and um, we, uh, we now have the excavation and, and foundation permits and are breaking ground in, in March. Uh, so uh, with a little bit of, of luck on our sites in exactly four years, this could be the view driving up and down the, the West Side Highway. Yeah, I'm out at Brooklyn. Now I'm down in Tribeca, right next to the narrow. But I'll be hood forever. I'm the new Sinatra. And since I made it here, I can make it anywhere. Yeah, they love me everywhere. I used to cop in Harlem. All of my Dominican Connors right there up on Broadway. Pull me back to that McDonald's. Took it to my stash spot, 560 State Street. Catch me in the kitchen like a Simmons whipping pastry. Statue of Liberty. Long live the world trade. Long live the king, yo. I'm from the Empire State. Actually, um, as, like, as, a, as an architect, um, you will, uh, if you don't already realize this, it happens quite rarely that you get to build anything. Uh, we've been around for uh, like 11 years, and we've built uh, 10 structures. Uh, but actually, the first structure that we got to build in Manhattan, like yesterday, it was Valentine's Day. Hopefully, some of you uh, experienced that. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, we, uh, we got invited to do this public artwork um, uh, in the middle of, of Times Square. I'll just, uh, essentially, it's a, it's a sculpture of, uh, of 400 acrylic tubes. Some of them have um, LEDs inside. And when people uh, touch uh, 
this, uh, this plate, uh, it, it starts beating. And uh, when more people either touch the plate together or touch each other, it, it measures the amount of resistance as it goes through uh, all of the connected bodies and it beats stronger and stronger the more people get, uh, get engaged. Uh, so um, here's a small sample and it's, even though it looks like there is a three-dimensional heart in there, it's just a forest of, uh, of, uh, of columns that create this, uh, this illusion. So here's a small taste of what it, uh, what it looks like. Push me and then just touch me till I can get my satisfaction. Push me and then just touch me till I can get my satisfaction. Satisfaction. Hear me. Thank you very much, Bjarke, for a very engaging lecture. And I'm sure there are very many questions in the audience, but I'm going to take the opportunity to ask the first question. <laughs> and I mean, you have a very engaging lecture, and, uh, it relate, uh, and you're very, very rhetorical. And not only verbally, but also the projects are very rhetorical, architectural rhetoric. Well, it's, uh, the, the project seems to have a clarity. Uh, um, they are legible, the figure is present. And I wonder how you work with that differently in the design process as well as in the process with the client. Or is that something that is, um, are they totally in tandem? Yeah, like, um, I mean, I think first of all, um, uh, the way we work, uh, and I think the way all offices work, but, uh, but I think in many ways we, we have really taken the consequence of this. We, we always collaborate even internally in the office, like, a, I'm here with uh, uh, my partner Jakob Lange and uh, my colleague uh, Catherine Huang, uh, who are responsible for, for the Yadid project. So, so and, and I think more than, uh, uh, than those two, there's like two more people that have been part of the team, um, maybe even a handful more during uh, the stressful moments. Uh, so, uh, so in that sense, it's always a collective effort. Uh, and um, my old Danish teacher, uh, which would be the equivalent of your old Swedish teacher, I guess. Uh, <laughs> she always used to say that if you don't write clear, it's because you don't think clear. Okay. Uh, and I think if, uh, I think we do discipline ourselves quite a bit in trying to think clear and speak clear and draw clear. Uh, so, because like, if everybody is unclear, then the only thing that's clear is that everything is unclear. It's like uh, nobody will understand each other. If like if, if Kat cannot express what she means, I won't understand it, and it's going to be this like nightmare of uh, uh, of frustration. So in that sense, we we do spend quite a lot of effort in like reiterating what is this project all about, uh, and also the the way we interact with the clients. In this case, like Yadid, for instance, is, was not a um, was not a competition; it was a commission. So we had the luxury of actually having multiple meetings with the clients, and we could present some ideas, and uh, some ideas uh, were more successfully received than others, uh, and, and that allowed us to sort of uh, st strengthen the arguments towards why did we go this way and why we're we not going this way, and sort of, I think in that sense, it's not like we, we sit down and think, and then we make the project, and then we make a presentation. The, the design process is actually a continuous reiteration of what ends up being the presentation. Mm. Interesting, very interesting. Any questions in the audience? Uh, up there. 
Um, hi. Uh, actually, um, when I see your presentation and all the things that Big did on the website, that when you d design some project, you have a really clearly, like, directly principle. But uh, as we know, when we do the architectural designs, that is kind of complicated experiences. So maybe sometimes we'll met some problem, which is like kind of try to broke your first principle. So I'm kind of wondering how to how you solve that problem. Did Did you get the question? I got slightly lost uh, two thirds into the question. Uh, maybe, maybe just recap uh, the main. It was like. Okay, so it's like uh, you have like really clearly and um, directly principle when you try to design some project, but sometimes the uh, process is not that simple. It's really complicated. Yeah. So if there's some issue, try to broke your first principle. Like maybe they can um, satisfy this aspect, but not satisfy that one, which uh, which is also necessary aspect. How you solve that? I mean, I think also, um, I, I think I get it. I mean, I think there's, there's like different, uh, there is a certain, uh, like, we, we made a, a book about our work that we called Yes is More, which is this sort of manifesto for an inclusive approach to architecture, not only uh, in the city, you know, that buildings can be inclusive, invite uh, people or life or the city to, uh, to engage, but also that the design process a big is inclusive in that it actually invites and incorporates input from uh, outside uh, the office, like from you know, the clients or the neighbors or the politicians or the building regulations or the financial limitations or whatever it is, to inform our design decisions. And uh, I think in the beginning when we look at a lot of different approaches, it also becomes a question of trying to find out what can this project be all about? It's, of course, a question of establishing criteria. What's going to be the biggest problem in this project? Uh, what's going to be the biggest potential? What are the, the key criteria that's going to inform our des uh, design decisions? But I think quite often architecture suffers from the fact that you are trying. I like the image of you know, an angry baby that's uh, sitting with this uh, baby toy where you have to combine uh, a brick uh, with a certain shape, with a hole that has a similar shape. And it's trying to train the baby to recognize the circle and put it in a circular hole. But sometimes the baby is going to try to smack the square through the circle, and, uh, and you know, no matter how much it insists, and it, can, it might even like, hammer it through, but it's going to destroy both the, the square and the circle. Uh, and I, that's often what architects is very much like, that you're trying to take a preconceived idea and you're going to try to force it through. And every single condition that you encounter becomes like an obstacle. And each time you get some kind of feedback, it becomes something that like grinds your idea down to the lowest common denominator, and you end up with a squircle. Uh, and I think uh, what we try to do is to uh, delay the, the preconceived idea and try to really find out, because you know, it's, it's going to be much easier to fall in love uh, with a girl if she already loves you. So like, if, in a way, where you if you, if, you, uh, if you fall in love with an idea that, uh, that can already happen, rather than insisting on some stupid idea that you should simply just do somewhere else. I think there's a major part of it. And so in that sense, paradoxically, quite often we manage to get away with things that are quite uh, outside of the ordinary, but it's outside of the ordinary that is very specific to this context. Like, um, I think all architects dream about doing an, a skyscraper that's twice as big at the top as at the bottom, but you, know, you can never get the client to do it because it's like stupid and expensive, unless you have a stupid site that has like a triangular footprint uh, uh, where you can actually increase the amount of your real estate value by turning the triangle into a rectangle. So something that would normally be a stupid idea suddenly becomes a really smart idea in this specific situation. So that was like the one chance we're probably ever going to get to do uh, um, a, squ a square angle. <laughs> Any other question? Thank you. Uh, we, we, uh, I'm wondering uh, about the structural engineers. Do you have an ongoing collaboration with a specific team, or do you work with different uh, structural engineers for 
different projects? Uh, we've been working uh, quite a bit with uh, AKT in London and with Arab uh, and with uh, Bureau Heppold. Uh, and uh, we're pretty promiscuous when it comes to engineers, apparently. I don't know. But um, uh, like, for instance, like Hanif Kera uh, from AKT, uh, who I think is part of the school also in some way, uh, has been like incredibly supportive. Um, from day one, like uh, he was very early in in seeing potential in us, and we've uh, we've done quite a few things together. Um, um, s s sadly, um, AKT have become very uh, good at getting uh, good fees, which has made it a little bit difficult uh, to ensure their jobs uh, uh, in in some projects. But uh, uh, we're working with them actually on a project in Umeo uh, right now, so. Um, so um, it's it's like it's a it's a long ongoing collaboration that hasn't materialized too much in in build form yet. So do you normally get to pick uh, the the structural engineers and and work together for for uh, from day one? Um, as a part um, of the deal with the contractor. Yeah, like it's essentially, um, like what typically happens is that um, a, a lot of our work is pre-qualification. Uh, so um, we we apply as a team, uh, and and there. Um, um, it's, it's essentially the business development department that the teams up. Sometimes the engineers find the, the job and we, we go with them. And of course, like the stuff we've been doing in Ch China, we've been doing it with Arab Shanghai and, and Arab Beijing. So it, it also a little bit depends on who is strong in, in what region. Um, but, but of course, it, it makes perfect sense to, uh, uh, to keep up good long collaborations. Um, but actually also on the other hand, I think actually once in a while to uh, like, you know, you always try harder on the first date, so uh, so that's also some, sometimes works in uh, collaborations. Um, do we have any more questions in the audience? Uh, one there. Yes. So it's a question a little bit about how the office uh, works, and uh, sometimes working in a design team, you develop a nice design that is clear and everything, but it just happens that the boss doesn't like it and you just have to start over. So, so on that notion, you have a very clear language, uh, but it also seems like the architecture also follows like a narrative, uh, and sort of from the book, just is more. So would you say that you try, I mean, what I'm trying to ask, are the designs there that are interesting and has the clarity and everything, but you just say, no, let's not do this, let's do more this, because it's in our language. Or is it more really that all the architecture that comes out is sort of, uh, sort of, based on the process more? That's a, it's an interesting question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have either Jakob or Kat answer it. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> no. Um. I don't, I, I mean, I, I think there is a distinct language uh, that we do use, but it's not something that's so conscious. It kind of arises from a lot of parameters. And the way we respond isn't so much a language as kind of trying to think more for the social kind of <laughs> benefit. There's always kind of, I think, I'm an, Amer I'm an American. <laughs> So uh, <laughs> I see uh, architecture a little bit differently, and I ended up in uh, Scandinavia. <laughs> is there is kind of a a bigger care for um, the social good that you don't see in the states, and a lot of the work isn't so much wants to kind of um, trying to create a social good. <laughs> As for kind of coming up with a design and having it knocked over, <laughs> if that's what you said earlier, I don't think. Very satisfying. We don't want to go into no. secrets <laughs> of no, it the development. So there was just one case where. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I actually think um, I think the the guys at the office work very well as editors in a way, where they kind of enhance. Um, it's not so much about a language, but rather about the idea about kind of enhancing the idea instead of knocking over <laughs> any design or language. 
Brilliant. Any more? It's, it's the a, truth. A couple of more questions. But, but actually, like, one, one specific thing, like, we do actually sometimes uh, uh, simply not allow ourselves to do a certain thing because somebody has done it in a similar way where we would be in essentially like, and it's a kind of silly thing, but it's also like, you know, it's like for, for us, the, the joy of the journey is the exploration of uncharted territory. And sometimes because we, we do return to, in a way you can see the, the, the building we're doing in Stockholm and the building we're doing in Manhattan is the same typology. It's a, an asymmetric uh, uh, courtyard typology, but it's, because they're in different contexts, they're quite different still as architecture, but, but they're somehow a similar DNA, but one has been living in a very tall uh, building, like a tall city, and one has been living in a, in a more sort of a friendly Scandinavian city, and, and that creates like very different architectures. Um, so sometimes we do revisit the same vocabulary again and again and again until we're really done. But, uh, but certain things, if, if it's too much the turf of one of our colleagues, uh, somewhere we wouldn't really go there. I actually had a, a very interesting uh, experience last night. Uh, I, I, somebody sent me uh, a letter to the editor that uh, a lady called Katerina uh, wrote. Uh, she's from uh, uh, Testbed Studio in Malmö in Architecten. Does anybody read Architecten? Uh, well, I do, the Swedish Architecten. Uh, and uh, it, was, uh, it was quite charming, it was like, um, with, um, with recent events, we have uh, won a lot of sort of attention even outside the realm of architecture. And now suddenly some, uh, in my mind, uh, really like low level blogger from one of the tabloids in Denmark has put a lot of uh, attention on trying to, you know, it's too suspicious that uh, we seem to be doing uh, interesting things even on a global scale. Uh, we must be cheating or stealing or whatever. Uh, and uh, he had found that Testbed Studio uh, designed a, um, a spiral bicycle parking for Malmö um, that you know, has curving ramps with bicycles like our uh, Danish Pavilion in Shanghai. So uh, his statement was that we simply stole the design. And he tried to call them up and try to ha have them say that we stole their design. Um, and, um, and they didn't want to do that. Uh, they, they, they sort of disagreed and they also, so like she also writes a whole essay about uh, exchange of ideas and, uh, and originality and, and so on and so forth. And then, uh, and in general, it's just like being a really nice and sort of uh, friendly colleague. Uh, I, was, I, I wrote her some kind of a thank you mail for being so nice. Um, but, uh, because I actually do think that since what we are trying to do is discover things, if you, go where everybody else has gone, you won't discover new things. Uh, and in that sense, sometimes there might be a really brilliant solution to something that we, or like really, really attractive solution, but we simply, we're, we're not gonna go there. We're gonna, we're gonna focus our time on one of the other directions because uh, it's less explored. Yes, I had a question uh, sort of drawing back to yours and also when you're talking about the baby with the circle and square and um, you know not a lot of I mean not a, you're based in Scandinavia and you've done a number of work here but you've also done it abroad but now you've opened an office in the States and um, it's a much different context there there's not the same kind of social responsibility and um, my question was do you approach projects there differently knowing that you don't have the same kind of Structure, infrastructure, so that you have in, um, and instead of just designing a building or an idea, but try and spread it out in a in a larger context. Are you conscious of that? I mean, I think. Um, I mean, one of one of the things we we discovered, like, is sort of in, if you're doing a, an urban space in, you know, like, for like the, the, with the the number eight. It was quite clear also for the client that the challenge of this neighborhood is if it's going to be lively or not, because it's like a pioneering neighborhood. So the whole idea about even walking up into the building was embraced as an idea of creating community. And that actually really works in Denmark. 
And we did notice that in New York, uh, we kept drawing benches and places to sit, and, and uh, they just kept saying that's going to attract the homeless people. Uh, so there's, and of course, you, you have to somehow work with that reality. You can't just be like blue eyed and, uh, and lame, because I mean, it won't be nice if there's a, you know, uh, a crackhead uh, uh, sleeping in front of your daughter's apartment in, uh, 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 on the west side. It's like, it's going to be really not nice, and then she's not going to live there, and then, you know, so, so you somehow have to f try to find ways of working with those mechanisms. One thing I do actually realize is that because in you know, Scandinavian socialism, uh, social responsibility is also to a large extent state-sanctioned or like, and you know, we expect the state to take care of culture and social issues. And, and of course, I, I also agree. But one of the things that exist in, uh, in America much, much more is private philanthropy and cultural entrepreneurism and social entrepreneurism, that the people that actually have certain capacity uh, are naturally expected to be involved in, uh, in these things. So, so there is also a kind of dynamism, or maybe there's like a social entrepreneurship. entrepreneurship in terms of philanthropy and uh, your cultural philanthropy, social philanthropy, is something that is less known in, um, in uh, I think, Scandinavia. You more have like some kind of state body that takes care of that. Uh, whereas, if you have an idea for something, you know, if you have an idea for something in, in Denmark, it's going to be hard to write a letter to the social minister. Uh, whereas, if you have an idea for something in, uh, in America, people will actively do something about it and fundraise it and, uh, and get it to happen. So I think the two systems have, have, have various uh, possibilities. I, I guess what I'm trying to say there is that, yes, you get the financing, you know, like you can say, you can fundraise and you get the private backing, but it's more project specific where here you have much more of an infrastructure so if you build this area out in the outskirts of Copenhagen the municipality before they've even okayed it they're going to make sure that there's a bus system getting out there that there's a that the train is going to get out there so that it's going to eventually connect with the city and um, in the states it's you know my experience I grew up there is it's a little bit more um, not quite organic is the wrong word, but you know things can crop up and then they can become a total oasis and they never connect to the city or there's not the bigger picture. Yeah. Well, I, th I, think, I think a lot of the things that, that maybe we take for granted here are actually really popping up there. Like everything, uh, I mean, Bloomberg has been, I mean, I know New York better than the other cities in, uh, uh, in the States, but uh, you know, Bloomberg has been incredibly good at hiring really, really good people. Uh, so, like Amanda Burden, the chairman of the Department of City Planning, uh, Jeanette Sadikan, the Department of Transportation, uh, they've been like very visionaries. So, like, you know, they do talk about transit oriented development. They are building a new uh, subway line on, on Second Avenue. They, you know, they, they've paved more bicycle paths than we have in Copenhagen now over the last five years. It's also a bigger city, but uh, it's. They have planted like 700,000 trees in their plan to reach a million trees. Uh, so, so in many ways, uh, they, they really do care about these things. And I think the typical sort of uh, um, don't give a shit about the rest kind of uh, free American uh, idea is more maybe the, the middle of America or maybe even something of the past. Uh, and Okay, so Manhattan is, is actually social democratic. We pay 40% in tax. So it's like, a, it, in many ways, it is quite different from, uh, from sort of a, a... Difficult to use uh, New York as an example since it's, it exists much more like a European city. But if you go to the Midwest where, uh, you know, you have large, uh, medium-sized cities in, by American terms and they barely have public transportation, let alone bike paths. And... Um, no, it's just a question if it's something that you're engaging in as you have starting a practice over there, um, something that you're thinking about, because I would imagine your approach to those kind of projects would be different than yeah. you. I mean, we're not going to go into politics, but, uh, but, but, but I do think that one of the reasons that we have uh, 
that we have a, a fair amount of opportunities. Yeah, he's like, take that microphone before she, <laughs> <laughs> she, she restates the question again. No, like, uh, uh, I think one of the reasons that we're actually getting like, quite good opportunities is that I actually think that America has, in a bizarre way, been really split between having like 99% super corporate offices, and then the avant-garde was, you know, West Coast crazy, like sort of uh, funky shapes that are like difficult and expensive, but don't really do anything in terms of their, you know, performance. Uh, they just look uh, amazing or whack. And, uh, and I think also like timed with the crisis, everybody was asking us why, why on earth are you opening up of office in America when you should be opening an office in China? Because that's where all the growth is. Um, I actually think that America had an interesting moment where post uh, 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 you know, financial crisis uh, and bank uh, collapse, the, the sort of America got so challenged as a superpower um, that, that everybody sort of naturally started questioning all of the recipes of the past and this sort of, you know, big car uh, model that made sort of most of the car companies crumple. Uh, they have now like sort of started spawning a lot more innovation and they're sort of... So, so I think also America is in a very interesting moment where social responsibility and environmental awareness is actually seen as an incredible uh, resource and, f and following the typical American market model, that becomes a competitive advantage if you bring these things to the table. So in that sense, I really believe that America has a, a quite unique capacity to turn around quite quickly. And in that sense, it's a, it's a very dynamic place to, uh, to be as an architect right now. Thank you, Bjarke. Thank you very much for a wonderful lecture.